Well, welcome again, everyone. And um, I'm going to introduce tonight, with great pleasure, Professor John Potts. And the title of his paper is From Clay to Cloud, The Past, Present and Future of Writing. And a small uh, bio on John. John is Professor of Media at Macquarie's um, MMCSS, which I don't need to introduce. His research interests include media history, digital technologies, network cultures, contemporary art and intellectual history. He has published six books, including A History of Charisma, Radio in Australia, Culture and Technology uh, with Andrew Mur Murphy and edited collections after the event New Perspectives on Art History with Charles Merriweather and The Unacceptable with John Scannell. He's a founding editor of SCAN, online journal of media arts culture. He is convener of the annual Future of Writing Public Symposium, which brings together publishers, authors, journalists, and scholars to debate the challenges and opportunities for writing in the digital and online em environment. And it's with great pleasure that I um, ask John to come and give his public lecture, which will be followed by Peter Doyle's response, and then uh, we'll open it up to the public for questions. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, Joseph, and good evening. In the 1941 Howard Hawks film, Ball of Fire, Gary Cooper plays a mild-mannered academic called Professor Potts. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> Professor Potts is endearingly old-fashioned, unworldly, entirely scholarly, and dedicated to books. Here he is learning self-defense from a book. <laughs> Professor Potts and his six academic colleagues are working painstakingly and very slowly on a, compiling a dictionary of slang. The seven scholars, who mo bear more than a passing resemblance to the seven dwarves, live in an appealingly sealed off world of academic inquiry, proceeding at a stately pace in attempting to understand and document the vernacular world outside. Their hermetic world is suddenly overturned by the arrival of Barbara Stanwyck, who plays, as only she can, a fast, wise-cracking dame, in this case also a gangster's girlfriend. On the run from the violent gangster, she takes refuge with the professor and his fellow academics, judging their insular world a safe hiding place. Needless to say, the seven scholars learn more slang from her in a day than they had accumulated in months of research. Sometimes I feel a bit like Gary Cooper in this film, as opposed to, say, Gary Cooper in High Noon. Because I and my academic colleagues, many of whom are here, work in an appealingly sealed off world of scholarly inquiry, trying to make sense of the fast paced vernacular world outside. In our case, as media scholars, the object of our inquiry is the media landscape, a terrain changing so fast and so fundamentally that our attempts to grasp the impl implications of these changes can seem as slow moving and as bumbling as the efforts of Professor Potts and his worthy colleagues to master the rude and hard edged world of slang. The rapid shift in the media sphere bears directly on our subject for tonight, the future of writing. Only 15 years ago, after all, the primary vehicles for writing were as they had been for many decades, if not centuries. The printed newspaper for journalism, the magazine for longer articles and entertainment, the printed book for fiction and non-fiction. Today, the printed newspaper is in terminal decline, as only a small minority of newsreaders still avail themselves of newsprint. Magazines are closing regularly or steadily losing circulation, and the printed book, it's been confidently predicted, will soon be replaced by the eco-friendly, light, clean, and digital e-book, or other forms of digital online transmission. At least I'm not alone in finding the speed of change challenging. Last November, as Joseph said, I convened a two-day public symposium on the future of writing, drawing together journalists, publishers, writers, and media scholars to ponder the challenges and opportunities for writing in the digital online environment. The presiding mood over two days was uncertainty, mixed with a strong dose of bewilderment and a dash of fear. The director of Fairfax Media, who was speaking on the first day, lamented the catastrophic loss of revenue and circulation suffered by the once proud newspaper flagships, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Yet at the same time, he was cautiously optimistic about the potential for online news. The main problem, as he ruefully noted, was making the online version pay. 
A panel of three publishers, including one who runs a digital-only imprint, likewise peered quizzically, mostly pessimistically, at the e-book and digital publishing, doubting the current business models made this vessel for writing a viable re replacement for traditional book publishing. Other speakers noted the transformations brought to the world of writing by online technologies, especially social media. These transformations include the rise of online opinion as a challenge to editorial and news, and the emphasis on speed in breaking news stories in the age of Twitter, whereby the 24-7 news cycle has accelerated. The cycle is now the length of time it takes to type 140 characters. Uh, I've also edited uh, the best of the proceedings of that symposium last year, and it will be coming out, fittingly enough, as an e-book published by Palgrave Macmillan later this year. And hopefully uh, it will be an ongoing event. The next one is on September, and we'll be looking at uh, the future of publishing. Nobody, of course, can predict the future with confidence and accuracy. It's possible, however, to draw a line from developments in the present into the near future of publishing, journalism, writing, and reading. The present is already bewildering enough, characterized by rapid technological developments and disruptive upheavals in media industries. The cultural transformation affected by digital convergence and network communication has been dizzying and for many disorienting. None of the old certainties, political, corporate, economic, seems to hold and the future, including the future of writing, is thrown into doubt. In this strange new world, white is the new black and up is the new down. Any individual may now self-publish by means of a blog, Facebook page or Twitter account. Convergence means that almost everyone carries around with them a device that's simultaneously a phone, computer, camera, GPS navigator and access to the internet. Much of the transmission and reception of information occurs wirelessly in the cloud or in network repositories of computer servers. The cloud, also known as the Celestial Library, Celestial Jukebox, Celestial Cinema and Celestial Gallery, stores enormous reservoirs of text, movies, music, and still images to be accessed by users and subscribers from any point, including from portable devices. Entire industries such as the music industry have been imperiled or at least obliged to build new business models in order to survive. Information wants to be free was the rallying cry for electronic civil libertarians in the 1990s. In the decades following, information has been, for many downloaders, free of charge. When digital information can be transmitted instantly across the internet and downloaded for free, the old structures, businesses and media forms are simply bypassed and left to wither. Unless new business models for online publication can be concocted, entire tranches of media forms, the endangered old world technologies like books and magazines and newspapers, may be at risk of disappearing. The new technologies and means of distribution are built on digital information, <coughs> the immaterial and network connections allowing easy transfer of that information. Is writing about to dissipate completely into the digital realm, leaving behind its material base? Will old-fashioned writing formats, like the newspaper, magazine and book, be vaporised, unloved and ungoogled, replaced by their immaterial successes? Yet, it's also apparent that today more people are writing than ever before. Teenagers text endlessly, while individuals blog and communicate through Facebook pages, and other social media. News is increasingly delivered by the high-speed express of Twitter. Writing will survive, indeed flourish, in some form, even if venerable forms such as the newspaper and printed book no longer play a prominent part in the distribution of writing. Today we can explore the possibilities of the future and the means by which writing will be expressed in that future. The smartphone, as we know, allows communication by text, email and social media all drawing users into the virtual sphere, no matter where they are in geographical space. Such as the rampant love of messaging, of sending and receiving information on social media, that we've entered a stage of infophilia, an overwhelming love of information and a need to check Facebook or Twitter for updates and new information. From the New Yorker this week. Our dependency on communication devices has reached an almost frightening level. Many young users report an inability to stop checking their phone, to put it away even for an hour a day. The love of messaging is also a technophilia, 
a love of the machines that make the message possible. Much that we've discussed already concerns technology, the new mobile digital technologies and network communication. But it shouldn't be forgotten that writing is itself a technology, one of relatively recent invention in human history. Historians of writing generally agree that complete writing may be defined as the sequencing of symbols to graphically reproduce human speech and thought. Of course, other forms of inscription existed before the invention of phonetic writing, including cave painting and many forms of ritual markings. But writing which represented speech using symbols inscribed on a durable surface developed only about 6,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and became systemized phonetic writing less than 5,000 years ago. The impact of this technology of writing on human consciousness and culture has been profound. Walter J. Ong, the great scholar of orality and literacy, has claimed that more than any other single invention, writing has transformed human consciousness. Writing creates a new space for knowledge. Writing is an artificial memory. It makes possible analytical thought through the practice of rereading and studying a text. It fosters abstractions of thought as well as precision and linearity. Phonetic writing is an intellectual technology which restructures consciousness into a new intellectual ecology. The other thing about writing as a technology is that it needs other technologies to be realized, that is, writing instruments and materials for inscription. Writing began on clay tablets in Mesopotamia around 5,000 years ago, using a reed stylus to press wedge shapes into soft clay, which then dried. These were the first tablets, and some, in fact, were palm-sized, containing miniature text to be read as a handheld mini-tablet. We've taken 5,000 years, in fact, to return to handheld tablets as vehicles for the written word. Other vessels for inscription have included wax, ivory, metal, glass, papyrus, parchment, and finally, paper. The mass reproduction of the written word made possible from the middle of the 15th century by the Gutenberg printing press wrought enormous cultural and political transformation. Elizabeth Eisenstein, in her extensive study of the printing press as agent of change, declares that the press affected the most radical transformation in the condition of intellectual life in the history of Western civilization. The precision in large-scale copying enabled by the printing press encouraged the development of the scientific method, along with other forms of rational inquiry. The Reformation exploded in the wake of printed and circulated text, as later did nationalism. The encyclopedia became the great storehouse of knowledge, emblem of the Enlightenment. As literacy rates rose in the 19th century, books proliferated to meet the demand of new hungry readers. Circulation libraries were established to make books available. Dime novels and other cheap paperbacks sold in increasing number. The free circulation of books symbolized the circulation of ideas, knowledge, and freedom to think. When a totalitarian regime sought to restrict thought and beliefs, it staged book burnings. Books, durable capsules of thought and creativity, have helped inspire the great social movements of the last 200 years. But what of writing today and tomorrow? Much writing of the future will take the form of e-books, online news, blogs, social media, self-published online works, text downloaded to tablets or smartphones. Does it matter then that the vehicle for writing changes? Nietzsche thought so. Our writing instruments contribute to our thoughts, he wrote in 1882, having recently acquired a typewriter, which um, later on he professed altered the way he wrote and thought. Can we isolate effects of online technologies then on the practice of writing? One area of impact will be spelling. David Crystal, professor of linguistics and prolific overseer of the English language, last week became David Crystal Ball and peered 50 years into the future of the written form of the language. He predicted that written language on the internet will alter the spelling of words in English, particularly those words with irritating silent letters. We can call this the rhubarb effect, since this is one word which Crystal predicts will undergo change. The professor remarked that 10 years ago he started monitoring the word rhubarb with the H and without by typing both spellings in a, into a search engine. 10 years ago, rhubarb spelt like this produced only one or two hits. A few years later, it yielded hundreds. Then a few years later still, it registered hundreds of thousands of hits. 
Crystal predicts that in 50 years, the two spellings on the internet will be equal, creating pressure for an, an inevitable change of spelling for words such as this, whose irrational silent letters provide some of the English language's quirkiness that we all love, but also the terrible difficulty it presents to those learning the language and its spellings. The H in rhubarb is irrational, and the technology of the internet will, according to Professor Crystal, foster a new rationalization of the English language, following the previous effort by Americans, that we all know, in their rendering of the ancient tongue. Much recent scholarship on the impact of internet has focused on its effects on reading, and by extension, the cognitive processes of the human brain. In his recent book, The Shallows, Nicholas Carr collected evidence from studies in psychology and cognitive science, demonstrating that the cognitive overload of web-based reading with its multi-message format interferes with the cognitive activities of reading and comprehension. The result is a new form of reading, browsing and scanning, prone to constant distraction and interruption, a superficial attention to text and knowledge. Yet there are many commentators and critics who reject these findings or who find that the benefits of online writing and hypertext, I link therefore I am, outweigh any disadvantages. Some indeed have praised distraction as a stimulus to connectivity and creation. Much of the recent research on the future of writing has praised the opportunities to publish enabled by connectivity. Here comes everybody is one slogan, the other is the people formerly known as the audience. More people than ever now are writing and publishing or self-publishing online text, blogs, Twitter, Facebook pages. This constitutes a daily me to some extent, but the point of online writing is to connect with others, to make your text available for other readers and writers. The new forms of collective intelligence made possible by online connections such as Wikipedia testify to the potential of knowledge through connectivity, the wisdom of the crowd. This information abundance has been celebrated as a form of empowerment, an army of Davids, we the media, a new form of mass collaboration based on electronic self-publishing. When there's so much being written and read online without the need of previous publishing structures and gatekeeping, there's a greater need perhaps for curating, for filtering and selection of texts. Many of the startup online companies, such as Small Demons here, do precisely this curating written texts and grouping information, helping readers make some sense of the overwhelming glut of written communication on the web. We can now turn our attention more closely to specific domains of writing to assess the transformations wrought by the latest generation of technology. One of the principal domains of writing is journalism, the fourth estate, or perhaps estate 4.0 in its online incarnation. Journalism is faced by enormous challenges in the context of new content platforms, formats, and distribution networks, including online news and social media. Historically, the printing press made possible the first mass-produced printed newspaper, uh, generally reckoned to have been published in Germany in 1609. The Gothic font, still on the New York Times and Sydney Morning Herald mastheads, bears a trace of the early years of printed newspapers when Gothic was common. A free press became an essential component of liberal democracies, but the decline of the newspaper from its heights in the 19th and 20th centuries has been swift, dating from the early 1990s. Newspaper circulation in the West began dropping at the rate of 1% per year in 1900, 1990. Loss of circulation and advertising revenue accelerated from the mid-1990s, corresponding to the rise of the World Wide Web. The last newspaper, it's been predicted, will stagger off the presses in 2043, and many observers consider that a generous assessment. Other media commentators have prophesied an earlier endpoint for print newspaper production, such as 2020. In the UK, one-fifth of local newspapers have closed over the past seven years. In the US, newspaper advertising revenues have plunged 50% in the past five years. There is a website called the Newspaper Death Watch, which counts, counts the newspaper corpses and chronicles, chronicles the death of the species, largely in America. In Australia, overall daily newspaper circulation has declined over the past 27 years by more than one third. It should be noted, however, that this tale of decline in newspaper circulation and revenue is not universal. There are parts of the world, such as India, where print newspapers are booming. 
In India, which has at least 85,000 individual newspapers, newspaper circulation and advertising are actually rising. The Times of India has a daily circulation of 4,300,000, the largest of any English language newspaper in the world. There are a couple of factors specific to India, however, which distinguishes its newspaper environment from Western counterparts. Literacy is still rising there, feeding a hunger for cheap printed news and information, and there's little online competition. Less than 10% of the population in India has access to the internet, while smartphones and tablets remain prohibit prohibitively expensive for the great majority. The printed newspaper in India costs five cents a day and is delivered free. Non-English newspaper circulation is growing at 5% per year. In Australia, by contrast, print circulation and revenue has fallen fast. Today, only 23% of the Herald's readership is buying the paper version. Every year, I survey my undergraduate media students on their reading habits, and their responses are perhaps indicative of the so-called digital natives who've grown up with the internet and social media. They are around 20 years old on average, and there are often around 100 of them, which makes percentages easy to calculate. Only 5% over the last few years profess to regularly buy or subscribe to a print newspaper. In some years, the figure is as low as 2%. Uh, those 2% are also the rare exceptions in their generation, conscientious objectors to Facebook. It's easy to see why there is a distaste for printed news among the internet generation. The paper is by necessity yesterday's news. It can be, seem old and slow and stale. It can, the paper itself can be cumbersome and you have to pay for it. The online version of the same newspaper, by contrast, features current breaking news video features, readers' questions and blogs, and it's been free up to, up to now. What are the differences then between print and online versions of the same paper, the same news rendered by different technologies? The online version features most read stories and most watched videos, which can tend to celebrity items and sensational crime stories. International news can sink down the contents page. I've had conversations on current events with a friend based on my reading of the Herald as a paper, and her reading of smh.com.au, and it became apparent that we'd read quite different versions of the news. We couldn't actually connect with any of our topics. Online news editors are faced with a great temptation to lead with the type of story likely to record the highest number of hits, and this was a temptation ruefully confirmed at the Future of Writing Symposium last November by the Fairfax News Director. Editors have access to instant feedback on the popularity of stories, which may well influence the selection and arrangement of online news items. The online news can appear quite a different proposition to the printed version. Much recent discussion on the future of journalism, however, has not been funereal, but rather optimistic, focusing on the potential of on online news and digital delivery. Even the newspaper Death Watch site, as you can see, has a twofold mission, to chronicle the death of the old newspaper and to celebrate the rebirth of journalism. This trumpeted resurrection is to occur in the virtual realm, online. The new world of news, as text, photographs, sound and video, is to be found in online news outlets, able to respond instantly to events and to include blogs, social media like Twitter and other contributions from citizen journalist prosumers, as they're called. The Guardian Online, for example, is a celebrated um, instance which includes reviews by readers as amateur critics and has a very extensive ongoing list of bloggers responding to news stories. The Huffington Post is also a successful exponent of the new online journalism. It's high profile and popular with online advertisers, but even enthusiasts of online journalism admit that the online version of newspapers like this can tend towards the sensationalist and trivial spectrum of news reportage. The Huffington Post has been mocked for its frequent image, use of images such as this. The internet, of course, is full of photos documenting the cute, the domestic, the furry, the distracting, the trivial, the personal, and most of all, the cute. And online journalism often panders to this demotic need to view cats dressed in woolly outfits or jumping into boxes or both. Of a different order, though, is the Global Mail, which is um, housed in part uh, here, or we, our students intern on it. Uh, which showcases the potential of the online format for serious long-form journalism and features um, aspects which are specific to the format, such as the photographic essays that you can click through. 
One of the pressing issues for online news is the question of making it pay. It's been estimated that an online ad is worth only one-tenth of its print news equivalent. Indeed, the relative value of ads in the old-fashioned papers is providing the revenue for the online news, which attracts the great majority of readers. Perhaps for this reason, print newspapers may hang on a little longer than has been predicted, at least until new business models can be conjured for online news delivered to tablets, smartphones, and computers. Strategic business planning in this regard entails what are called metered subscriptions, as practiced by the New York Times online, or the so-called porous paywall, in which some online items remain free to visitors. Fairfax Media, in a very timely manner, is, has announced they're introducing a metered paywall for the Herald and the Age on July the 2nd this year, with subscriptions for online editions of the papers ranging from $15 to $44 a month. A move which is regarded by media commentators as an inevitable, if belated, attempt to make online news financially viable. Okay, if writing as journalism looks to have an increasingly online destiny, what of the venerable printed book, a vehicle for writing that's far older than the newspaper? The codex form of the book dates to the first century. The CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, has declared that the physical book and bookstores are dead, to be replaced by the Kindle and other new vessels for digital text. The e-reader e is upheld as a vehicle of progress, displacing the old-fashioned printed books already referred to a little disdainfully as p-books, or more contemptuously as dead tree books. The advantages of the Kindle and other e-reading devices have been glowingly recounted. The Kindle is light, can store an enormous number of books, can access a huge data library, can be read at night, is kind to travellers, and is even kinder to the environment. A true story, someone told me, of a Kindle user who joined a book club, only to be presented um, much to her dismay, at the first night with a copy of the printed book as the current reading matter. They said, take this book away and read it. When she came back, um, she professed to being very unfamiliar with the properties of the traditional book as a kindler, um, and she struggled with the text. When asked for her opinion on the book at the gathering, the book club, she replied, I found it heavy. When asked what about the book she found heavy, she clarified its weight. The drive to replace the printed book with its electronic successor is intense, at times ferocious. I discovered this myself when I had an article published on the Conversation website this January, daring to suggest that the print book may survive longer than anticipated by many uh, so-called futurists. Some of the online response was furious, with much use of the terms obsolete and dead trees. I think obsolete was intended for me. Even a suggestion of the book's survival seemed to provoke rage. This is, in fact, how the ebook online camp sees the future. Objects made of paper and ink, your time is up. If you were animals, you'd be put down in acts of mercy. If you were characters in a film, you'd be described as washed up, has been, grizzled, overweight, self-indulgent, and far from pretty, much like Orson Welles' character in Touch of Evil. Fallen in the trash, his future all used up. If the newspaper is not long for this media sphere, then the book cannot be far behind it. Why should the plant matter book survive when its successor, environmentally friendly, convenient, opening to a vast digital immaterial library, is already here? The future of reading, we're told by the proponents of tomorrow, is in the cloud. The cloud, of course, is the immaterial zone where digital words, images, and sounds reside, waiting to be accessed. There'll be no need to turn trees into paper, no need to clutter homes with dust-gathering books. All that will be needed is a receptacle, small, handheld, portable, stylish, an essential part of your digital ensemble. This device will bring the cloud down to any reader. Any book, newspaper, magazine, poem, essay, or book chapter in electronic form will find its wireless way onto your device and into your hands. We can see how digital reading will work by noting the path already taken by music. The downloading of music files has been the intermediate phase in the trajectory that extends from record store to the cloud. Consumers of music download digital files from iTunes or other online stores, that is if they pay for them, or from file sharing sites if they don't. The next phase of music consumption has moved beyond downloading to online subscription services such as Spotify, which offer unlimited access to a vast online music library, 
In this scenario, there's no need to download because the virtual music collection is always on, always available, a celestial jukebox. If the music industry is drifted into the cloud, the publishing industry must, according to digital logic, follow. In the vision of Bezos and his fellow captains of information, the vessel for digital text is now central. Amazon's candidate is the Kindle, launched in 2007. Bezos claimed that a digital sales tipping point was reached in June 2010, when Amazon sold more e-books than hard book hardbacks for the first time. There are many other reading devices. Uh, the most publicised e-reader, however, has been Apple's iPad. What accounts then for the zeal of this contemporary narrative, in which the book is so disrespectfully hurried to its own doomsday? Much of this terrible enthusiasm emanates from corporate PR and the blogs of amateur IT cheerleaders. It's the language of boosterism, which celebrates the path that leads to the new and away from the old. Hype here is short for hyperbole, which courses through this rhetoric. The grandiloquent claims made for a virtual future double as promotion for the devices marketed in the present. You too can be part of the glorious tomorrow by purchasing your Kindle or iPad today. The bold vision of a celestial library glosses over the many obstacles in its path, most notably the conflicting demands of rights holders. The world's music and book libraries are still owned by the world's record companies and publishers. These power brokers pose legal and economic challenges rather than technological ones to Google, Amazon and Apple as they attempt to build their respective virtual libraries. The contentious Google book settlement of 2008, which divided authors, groups and publishers, is indicative of the developed difficulties inherent in this area. In the world of harsh reality, as we heard at the um, Future of Writing last November, the publishing industry has struggled, like the journalism industry, to adapt to a digital online environment. Publishing houses have restructured to accommodate digital delivery, but have found it difficult to make ebooks and online publishing a viable financial concern. Ebook prices have been set so low, largely through the loss leading policy of Amazon, and e royalties remain so low that publishers have yet have not successfully forged new business models for the new technologies of publishing. Despite these realities, the onward drive to a digital future is generated from the engine room of modernity itself, the doctrine of progress. This doctrine is now focused almost exclusively on information technology, which in part explains the fierce intensity of claims made for this sector. The language of progress has defined modernity since its origin in the Enlightenment of the 18th century. Progress then became aligned with technological progress during the Victorian period, when new railway stations were hailed as cathedrals of progress and technologies of transport, communication and industry were celebrated as the drivers of an age of improvement. The fusion of progress with technological innovation was most sharply expressed in the 20th century. In the early decades of that tumultuous century, industrial production, rationalisation and marketing converged in the creation of the new, in the manufacture and selling of a new range of commodities and also the notion of the new itself. The high point of industrial progress was the 1960s, it's Zenith 1969, when rocket technology reached all the way to the moon, the space age beckoned, energy knew no limits, and popular culture brimmed over with optimism. The media sage of the 1960s, Marshall McLuhan, observed the march of progress in terms of media. He saw the new age of electronic media, TV, radio, rock music, advertising, and the satellite. The swarming energy and electric speed of the new media was sweeping aside the staid, linear, predictable world of printed media. McLuhan saw the generation gap and counterculture in media terms. When Bob Dylan sang in Ballad of the Thin Man, something is happening here and you don't know what it is, McLuhan heard you as the older generation and it as electric media. For McLuhan, the fate of old media was to become the content of new media. Plays become the content for films, Films become the content for TV. Newspapers become the scripts of radio and TV news. The process was inevitable as new communication technology created the global village of electric media. The logic of media progress espoused by McLuhan and others would see the old medium of the book become the content of the new online media technology, the celestial library. The McLuhanite division of generations along media lines is also evident in contemporary culture in which the digital natives who've grown up with the internet mark themselves off in many ways from older generations by means of digital technology, social media. 
This generation and succeeding ones will, according to the imperative of progress, leave the newspaper and book behind and embrace the universe of immaterial text. However, the fundamental difference between today's hymns of progress and those of industrial modernity is that faith in industrial progress has long since expired. It went into terminal decline around the same time as the Apollo space program in the 1970s. Industry became associated with pollution, waste, environmental disaster, and finally global warming. Progress has gone so far into reverse in the industrial zone that the future is viewed not with hope but with trepidation, and industrial pollution plays the role of villain. Recycling and sustainability are all attempts to undo the damage wrought by previous generations unquestioning faith in technological progress. This means that the doctrine of progress has now swung fully behind information technology. Progress is now measured in terms of faster, smaller, more flexible. The post-industrial world of information is depicted as clean and free of industrialism's sins. E-books save trees. Corporations can pursue the strategies honed in the first decades of industrial modernity, such as planned obsolescence, while trumpeting their credentials as model green corporate citizens. Each new generation computer or smartphone renders its predecessor out of date. At the same time, each new model is a step toward the utopian future. Wireless, energy efficient, sustainable, increasingly immaterial. With so much force, economic, ideological and technological, behind this march of digital progress, will the book, the old-fashioned material, paper and ink book, become one of the future's casualties? The trouble with the logic of progress is that it's not really logical. The ardent proponents of progress speak with emotional fervor and with religious finality, as I found out. Progress is a language of discontinuity in which the old is thought to be obliterated by the new, which is inherently superior. But there's no reason for the old to disappear completely. According to the pitiless imperative of progress, radio should have been replaced by TV, which was such an advance on its predecessor that it amounted to radio with pictures, thereby consigning, consigning mere radio to oblivion. But radio in the 1950s simply adjusted its priorities, playing to its strength of talk and music, and survived. Similarly, films may have become the content of TV, but cinema did not die. Rather, it defined its difference to the newer audiovisual media and prospered. The latest incarnation of this strategy is the most six, six, recent successful adoption of 3D. History is in fact a conversation between past and present, and media history is no exception. The media sphere contains new media and old, the latter having stubbornly declined to retire. The architects of tomorrow propose a world of digital reading for us but that world comes at the expense of two central aspects of reading and owning books, the objecthood of books themselves and the difference built into individual libraries. If we abandon books and read only from the cloud, then we all have the same library. We participate in the world brain envisaged by H.G. Wells in the 1930s, but we erase individual difference, and the difference between libraries is what makes them interesting. A person's book collection is a display, a reflection of the self, it's a record in material form of the works that have helped shape that self. The ideas, arguments, knowledge, narratives, character and poetry drawn from those books over many years. The books carry pieces of the person's self with them, slices of personal history. The books age along with their owner, showing creases, wear, signs of character. When Walter Benjamin refers in his essay, Unpacking My Library, to the very mysterious relationship to ownership exercised by the book collector, He's looking beyond the book's function and use value to something more intimate, the memories attached to each book. These are memories of when and where the books were found, bought, read, discussed, housed and transported, the role they may have played in the owner's life. These memories are triggered by, triggered by the material presence of the books. Benjamin lovingly describes the smell, dust, feel of the volumes as he unpacks them. Books engage more than just the visual sense in the act of reading. They jostle all, this, all the senses with the possible exception of taste. We touch and hold the paper and cover. We smell the book's interior, especially when it's new. We hear the rustle of pages as they turn. Cover design, which has become increasingly important in recent years, also entrances the visual sense. Much of the pleasure of owning and reading books resides in this multi-sensory experience, as well as in the appreciation of books' material properties, binding, paper, stock, design, and font. 
This materiality evaporates in the cloud. The only material object in this scenario is the e-reader. The sensory experience of reading then becomes focused on the receptacle of digital text. When the e-reading device is as aesthetically appealing as the iPad, many readers may accept the terms of the new digital reading. Apple has, after all, forged this market position largely due to its superlative design. It's defined the look of post-industrial communications technology. Apple design looks like the future. It's intoxicated users with a love of technology, a love of applications, and a love of sending messages. The iPad and other e-readers in its wake will encourage many users to read from its glamorous touch screen, but only the most dedicated technophile will jettison books altogether. The disciples of progress see only tomorrow. If the past is viewed at all, it's with distaste and impatience. Patience, but it's hard to dismiss, dismiss the past of the book, which, like the wheel, has sheer longevity on its side. The codex form of the book, which are sheets between, bound between covers, has existed since the first century, when it was invented by the Romans as an alternative to the papyrus scroll. The success of Penguin Classics, sold for less than $10, has drawn on the retro, history-laden character of books. This has appealed across the generations, including young readers who delight in the lo-fi material object of the book. Indeed, the digital natives do not appear to be marching to the drumbeat of digital pro progress in this regard. Those same undergraduate students who have abandoned the newspaper profess a love for the printed book. Only 4%, when last surveyed, use e-readers instead of p-books. Their common complaints about e-readers include the strain of reading continuously from a screen, the difficulty of reading in certain light conditions, and the distractions from the text due to other information sources on tablets. There's also an enduring affection for the tactility of handling a printed book and for the sheer materiality of the book as an object that can be written on, bent, bookmarked, and added to your personal library. Perhaps this will change as an even younger generation goes to school knowing only e-textbooks. But even small children still seem to have a love for holding, folding, and tearing paper books as objects. The generations then have, that have rejected the newspaper have not also rejected the book. There's a firm distinction made between the old-fashioned media technology of the newspaper, ephemeral, representing literally yesterday's news, and the old-fashioned media technology of the book, which is still respected as an object of lasting merit, deserving to be owned, kept, and stored in a personal library. Certain media objects of the past, books, can perfectly well coexist with the new media forms of the present. Jeff Bezos of Amazon has confidently predicted that the physical book will shortly be dead, but he and other prophets of the book's demise seem a little laughable in the light of the book's long history. 2,000 years is a solid record of persistence. The material form of the book has survived since the Roman Empire. It's been loved as an object as well as container of knowledge. The book is not going to disappear because of a few di digital doomsday predictions. Its future is not yet all used up. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that illuminating history of, of the book and also for the hopefulness and the resilience of the book in the face of uh, the sort of push for modernity that, uh, and, and those narratives which are, are declaring it redundant and, and dead. But um, it was really amazing to hear that you think that there's still a future for it. Uh, in that context, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce a, another colleague from the department, Dr. Peter Boyle, uh, as our respondent for this evening. He's the author of City of Shadows, Sydney Police Photographs, 1912 to 1948, which, like its follow-up, Crooks Like Us, was based on extensive research in the Forensic Photography Archive of the Justice and Police Museum in Sydney. He's also the author of Echo and Reverb, Fabricating Space in Popular Music Recording, 1900 to 1960, and the novels The Devil's Jump, Get Rich Quick, and Amaze Your Friends, two of which won Ned Kelly Awards for Best Crime Novel. He lectures in media at Macquarie University. In 2010, he received a Ned Kelly Lifetime Achievement Award Thank you, Peter. If you can come and respond to John's paper. Yes, um, hello, and um, thanks for having me. It's a, a privilege and an honour to uh, 
be the respond dude to um, Professor Potts. And um, now that I'm here, more daunting than I anticipated, I must say. So uh, just sharing that with you before I start. Uh, yeah, um, so um, Professor Potts, I, I'm not sure what a respondent does exactly, whether I'm sort of like one of the uh, grizzled character actors <laughs> there or Barbara Stanwyck or, or what exactly. I think, yeah. Um, and, it, but, and, and particularly given that I um, kind of endorse everything that John said, so, uh, you know, I, I can't kind of call him out high noon style and uh, um, you know, <clears throat> contest what he, what he had to say. So all I can really do, I guess, is, is kind of add a, add a not too extended footnote to John's, uh, to John's very thorough uh, and, you know, I, I find very persuasive um, uh, picture. The, you know, future of writing is a phrase that recurred a bit there and has, has been used before in the, uh, the, the conference last year that John mentioned, uh, just a, a pen pal, a modern day pen pal, a person I communicate with but never met in person, a journo in uh, Canada mentioned that uh, he's doing uh, this week a, a talk on the future of reading. And, uh, and you're right, okay, so maybe we should all get together as, uh, you know, are they different things? And they kind of are, I guess, um, although they often get elided. Um, so, and uh, that made me think, well, what am I, uh, what barrel am I sort of to push tonight? And I guess just listening to John talk, just now, I, I kind of went, well, I'm sort of interested, I guess, in the future of writers, writing, writers, writing as an occupation, writers as a, as a group of workers, I guess. But then not really the future, because uh, maybe the present, or, and maybe the recent past, the present and recent past of writers, I guess, is what I'm, will be the core of my extended footnote. Um, Thanks, John, for that. I mean, I, I, I really just, before I get on to the future writers, the, um, that idea that, you know, uh, I, I guess um, one way of, of summarising to me what you were saying was that um, we've, we've been very in love with uh, models of technological change, of, of change of, of everyday practice that involve uh, complete displacement the new thing in a kind of revolutionary paradigm shifting way completely displaces something else. And as, you know, writers like um, uh, David Edgerton, a sociologist of technology, the shock of the old, uh, points out nearly all technological change is additive rather than of the displacement model. Things sit on top of the old, the old practice. And um, I, th I think we just see that happening all the time. You know, emulsion film, mag tape, they're kind of special cases. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe the Malthusian sort of catastrophic uh, predictions, um, Malthusian in, in tenor, do have a kind of marketplace clout. They do have a kind of publishing clout. They have a newsworthiness clout. But, you know, as Edgerton and many others have pointed out, things don't often play out that way in, um, in real life. So the present of writing, the present of writers, I guess one thing I'm really interested in is uh, kind of genres that have, um, genres and tropes and memes that have appeared in the last 10 years and particularly in the last five years around this matter of the future of writing or the writing that's and reading and forms of literacy that, are, that allegedly have no future. And I guess the genre of the new futurology as a kind of writing set piece, as a kind of writing that gives certain writers a gig. It's interesting to me the way a couple of sort of very kind of vigorous um, uh, classes or of quality non-fiction writing over the last 20 years have coalesced around this question. Remember in the 80s, uh, Oliver Sacks kind of introduced a new sort of genre of informed but readable neuroscience. You know, kind of half writer, half researcher on the cusp himself. 
um, huge publishing movement that followed that in, uh, you know, the neuroscience writing, Norman Doidge, Brain Plasticity, big bestsellers written nearly often by sort of middle ranking researchers who could write very well, write well enough to be published in the New Yorker or the Atlantic Monthly, something like that, um, but in touch enough with research practice. Sometimes journalists, just pure journalists, who were, who were science savvy enough to write about it. So there was a lot of neuroscience and all those books about brain, areas of the brain lighting up, um, uh, um, The, just lost that sentence, so I'm just going to leave that sentence there, just let it wander out the door on its own, buy a cup of tea. Up to the iCloud. <laughs> yeah, up to the iCloud, that's up in the cloud. Yeah, so neuros neuroscience, uh, fundamentally an optimistic sort of genre. I, I mean, I hope people know what I'm talking about here. There's been a lot of it, the fMRI machine driven stuff, areas of the brain lighting up. We now know that, blah, 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 memory, our conception of memory, our conception of creativity, our conceptions of... Our everyday brain activity very much changes, often quite optimistic because the idea of plasticity was that uh, the brain isn't formed as people used to think in the first couple of years. It kind of keeps changing over the course of a whole life. That kind of merged, it seemed to me, with the anxieties about literacy and digitality and screens. Um, I don't know, a few points. Uh, uh, John showed the Nick Carr, The Shallows. There was an article that came before that very persuasive article, I'm, you know, I guess most people here have read it, is Google making a stupid, much anthologised, and it's hard not to say, yeah, kind of, or as one of my students' dads said to him, well, son, people have always been stupid. <laughs> uh, but that was based, he drew uh, on, a, on a book by Marianne Wolfe, uh, one of those kind of researchers into dyslexia, called Proust and the Squid a few years ago, and uh, I mean, this is not my area, and I'm, I'm totally kind of faking this, but my understanding of that is um, Wolf argues that reading and reading extended narrative in alphabet-based languages, she's an fMRI person, lights up different areas of the brain in a way that no other kind of communicative activity does. So the kind of catastrophic discourse was that people aren't reading. This is a kind of a 2006, 7, 8 kind of moment, I guess. People are reading seem to be going down hugely. Uh, people aren't, you know, we're, we're developing a different kind of culture. It's all immediacy. There were studies of Siberian uh, cultures done in the 30s who were non-literate. People seem to have trouble conceptualising things that weren't present. They had trouble it, it, with all sorts of kind of things that we routinely do because, Wolf argued, we read. And if we stop doing that, then we go back to something where everything's on the surface. We go back to kind of modes of understanding where everything's on the surface, like, for example, celebrity culture. So the Wolf thing... Um, <coughs> in, uh, ..was picked up by a lot of writers. The difference here, I guess, it, 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 again, it seemed to me, to you know, formal way discourses of, of dealing with change. Uh, Marshall Berman talks about modernisms of acceptance and modernisms of rejection. And, you know, the, 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 the Professor Potzes of the world, you know, the crusty sort of crusty, you know, ivory tower uh, dudes. That is not where the new rejection discourses were coming from. They were coming from people like Nick Carr, who is a tech writer, a tech geek. They were coming from the heart of geek land, which is very interesting. Douglas Rushkoff, people who are very much a part of the first wave and second wave of digitality and digital communications were the ones who were sounding the alarm. The techno hipsters were, actually. But something seems to have happened since the Nick Carr shallows. I mean... Uh, and I must say, when I first read that article, I went, yeah, yeah, I relate. And it was basically Nick Carr, a, a journalist, had been a you know, guy in his 40s, he'd been writing for a long time, a number of books, good book about Google. You know, it's basically elevated journalism. But he said, his sort of opening riff was, it's been years since I finished a book. Uh, I do a lot of reading, but I'm gutting books. I'm, I'm distracted. Um, you know, it's, it's gizmos. And I read and I went, yeah, well, actually, you know, I'm not finishing books. I'm reading more reviews of books than I am reading books. 
And um, in Carr's article, that's a kind of cause for alarm, it is, again, this Malthusian projection, the sort of thing John talked about, where at this rate, we'll all be, you know, at some disastrous point very soon. And in fact, I went, yeah, I've got to get back into reading. It's so much fun. My life's better when I'm reading novels. What the hell? And so you turn it around very quickly. And I think a lot of people found that. And I found that even with our students, how there seemed to be a kind of dip a few years ago that might have passed. Just a little bit of anecdotal uh, stuff there. So what's happening with writing now? Um, and this is this will probably get me out of here, I hope. Um, I, I'm interested in what's happened with those... that tech literati. Um, Clay Shirky was mentioned, Nick Carr, Malcolm Gladwell, um, the, the people from the FRMI-driven neuroscience, popular articles in the New Yorker that are translated into books, that, are trans that become bestsellers. Well, what seems to be happening there is that, um, you know, the, the denizens of Grub Street, working journalists, working quality non-fiction writers, um, with the loss of outlets, um, they're disappearing. It's, it's disappearing as a, as a profession. But Shirky, Gladwell, um, a whole bunch of people like that are now making their real money, making their real income on the corporate speaking circuit, of course. So people, there is a, there is a little kind of career trajectory we can identify where you get in early at summit. This is in the more the American, so we're not only Anglophone, we're talking more American, uh, North American kind of zone here. Get your, get your attention-grabbing New Yorker article out about some matter of emerging, you know, cultural practice with a strong technological or scientific spin. Um, turn that into the book and then do the lecture circuit. Get the 40, 50 grand a night speaking, much more than you'd get, you know, at blitzing kind of book advances and, and book royalties. Even people who, in their haste to make it in that world, like Jonah Lira, you know, one of the young staff writers at The New Yorker, Mike Daisy, both of them disgraced over inaccuracy or plagiarism matters in the last year, has it been? Even, I hear this week, even Jonah Lira, now in the sort of pit of disgrace over the plagiarism and faking a thing in his creativity book is still getting, got recently paid 20 grand for a speaking gig in America. Gladwell has gone, is, Gladwell's at the top of the corporate speaking uh, uh, among writers uh, price tag. And it's very interesting, to, the TED Talk model, to look at what's, if you, if you look at, say, somebody like Malcolm Gladwell, just do a quick YouTube search and just look at three, three or four talks he's given. If you, I found, you know, in two minutes, something from 2006, something from 2009 and something from last year, a couple of TED Talks. 2006, he's kind of a nervous-looking writer, he, you know, he's too long inside, whatever, kind of speaking the way I am now in a hesitating and anxious way. By the second one, he's kind of loosening up. By the third one, it's the full TED Talk thing with the headset, the lighting, the multi-camera, the click, the click, the click, the laughs, the carefully, you know, and the whole TED Talk. I, I guess people know what I'm talking about with the TED Talk thing and the very stage-directed, you know, and it's what happens in a TED Talk, of course, is way beyond what, what old sort of editorial intervention was like. It's kind of like talking to people who are preparing TED Talks now. It's a heavy input and it's got to end on an upbeat note. Uh, as we know. <clears throat> so that's happening. We've kind of lost the middle. We've got a celebrity, uh, a celebrity culture. Uh, as Ian Collinson and Siobhan Lyons are kind of talking about celebrity writers. Uh, we've got a, the celebrity non-fiction writer. Interestingly, not happening so much in the UK, certainly not happen, happening much in Australia where there's not the population base to support the big money. I did a little search, a little Google search of videos of John Lanchester, wonderful writer, getting a lot of notice, and he kind of talks, and all the video of him out there, even the kind of well-funded ones, seem to be pretty much like a university lecture of kind of a stooped middle-aged man talking in a fairly uninteresting way, even though he's a wonderful writer. So that might be something happening more in America. Disappearing middle, lots of people writing, kind of quality stuff for nothing, few people using the writing to parlay that into something else. You know, maybe that's all I've really got to say. So uh, 
that's the end of my extended footnote. Uh, thanks again for, for being here, everybody, on such a cold and bleak winter's night. And thanks to John for providing us with uh, that wonderful big picture. Thank you, Peter. We'll open now to questions, for questions to Peter and, and to John, if you can come to the front, please. So, to the audience now, um, your moment to engage with our two wonderful speakers. Yeah, you probably know uh, Corey Doctorow, you know his writing. Uh, uh, well, Steve next to you is nodding his head. Uh, Corey Doctorow is a science fiction writer, but he's also very active in uh, the debates around copyright and what, what are called free cultures. And he's written um, a number of uh, articles or blogs um, and short articles that are collected in the book. And one of them is why I give away my books. And one of them is on that, that he finds it a very effective distribution model for that very reason, that he um, uploads them for free for people to download. Um, uh, and he argues he's not going to lose anything from that because people aren't going to pay for them anyway. People are just going to find a way to um, download them or not read them at all. And uh, it may well be that he uh, broadens the knowledge and exposure of his writing, his science fiction, as well as his non-fiction writing, uh, so that some, some time later down the track someone may decide they might actually pay to buy something. So it is a similar argument in the free cultures world to music, when they argued that the old intellectual property model wasn't working, it was just making record companies rich, and that in its, to, it's replaced by extra performing. So I was just thinking, you know, that musicians perform more rather than make money out of IP. Um, what Peter was just saying, is that the high end of those non-fiction writers are now performing in TEDs and getting money as a speaker. So it's a similar kind of thing. That um, if IP isn't going to work with the demise of that kind of copyright model, it's performance, or um, actually giving it away in the free economy or the gift economy with the hope of Ex uh, distributing it that way will increase your awareness and then you may get some kind of revenue or remuneration later on in the background. Um, the other thing is a lot of those online startup companies, like the small demons that I put up, um, one of the people we brought out last time for the um, future writers things was Richard Nash. He was a former um, small independent publisher. I think his press was called Soft Skulls or something like that. And then he went into that startup, which is a kind of um, an aggregator and a curator of um, a lots of different texts. So they take one particular text and do a whole lot of cross-referencing of all the things that are mentioned in that book, like um, High Fidelity by Nick Hornby, for example. They actually find all the things which could go into a website. Um, and then they just fund that through some kind of advertising or online, online presence, but it's using that the internet as a massive distribution machine, as a new kind of um, online writing or curating and then filtering, if you like. I don't know, Peter, what, anything more? No, I've got nothing really to add. It, it's, um, it's just interesting, though, mentioning people like Richard Nash, um, mm -hmm. who... Uh, seems to make his living, and he's a nice man, and I like him and respect him, but uh, seems to make his living going from startup to startup mm -hmm. with a kind of idea like hypertexting every single reference in high mm -hmm. fidelity, which seems to be enough to parlay him mm -hmm. into another finance startup, and when the money runs mm -hmm. out, he kind of skips to somewhere else, which, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's anything dishonourable about that. He actually brings in a lot of very mm -hmm. positive ideas. And one of his ideas, actually, Liz, in answer to your question, that he's been running for years is that what... Um, creatives want isn't actually, I mean, they've got to pay the mortgage and they've got to put food on the table, but it's not wealth, it's, there's a kind of, you know, 
a, a need to be to, to 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 contact, you know, reach out, the the voice, and whatever. Um, so he kind of has this model of publishers or in, uh, um, mediators who will join creatives with their audiences, like literally in spaces in. As it's turned out, maybe people are just doing. People don't even need the mediators to do that. So that was a kind of line he was running that might have been hopeful to a kind of new model of publishing, which could apply to music just as much. You're there to kind of broker something, but in fact, with social media, I don't know if people even need the in-between company anymore. He also makes money out of going and giving talks. He does. He does. Which circuit. is, you know, that's the the, the, the kind of keynote circuit. Which, um, mm. I mean, I, I don't mean to be kind of offhand or, or kind of flippant about that, that's a living too. Mm -hmm. He does worry about such things. Mm -hmm. Catherine. Um, thank you for that uh, really illuminating um, talk. It's a very good jokes to start with. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered if you could, perhaps um, this is a particular perspective coming mm -hmm. from uh, you know, filmmaking and writing, mm -hmm. um, but as an avid reader, mm -hmm. Challenge to mm. that idea that we're hearing too often by futurists mm. um, that new technologies in simple ways replace old, mm. and clearly they don't. And so mm. it's really fantastic to hear that point made so well um, um, and so on this evening. But I'm interested in maybe some of the more positive aspects, mm. if we can see any, um, about, uh, about some of these shifts. Um, mm. You know, the, no the notion of the library that one has, you know, um, Pierre Bourgeois talks about the inner library. Um, mm -hmm. that we have, rather than the kind of material objects, and certainly as someone who's mm -hmm. read a lot on, mm -hmm. you know, e-books, especially e-books for the last few years, as well as mm -hmm. um, retaining a kind of library of books, mm -hmm. I find that idea of the inner library incredibly persuasive, mm -hmm. um, rather than it being out there, we still, through our reading, um, you know, make libraries out. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, and if I could throw in another question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also interested in um, what you might make of uh, Gunter Kress and people, for example. Um, again, obviously, this is very relevant to those of us who work across um, yes. screens um, and the page and so on. Um, but Gunter Kress, for example, um, takes up the idea that writing is increasingly a multimodal activity, um, which mm. very much fits the kinds of things yep. that you're saying about new technologies and ways of doing things, not replacing mm -hmm. old. So mm. that instead of writing only with text, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that you did, digital technologies and processes make it possible is make it more easier for us to work with sound, mm. um, to write with sound mm -hmm. and image um, as well as text. I must say I find that mm. a highly persuasive um, kind of argument. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I know Gunter Kretz, he was my old mentor at UTS and a, a, a world-famous uh, social semiotician mm -hmm. and I uh, also examined my PhD thesis, so I know him quite well. Uh, yes, and, and he, I am aware of what he was saying about multimodality of writing. I was also, um, I think in the 90s, I started to see the writing of Pierre Levy, I don't know if you know, who wrote, um, it popularised the idea of collective intelligence and started to talk about writing as a multimedia form that it does include um, still image, moving image, sound, and so he was talking about the multi-modality of writing. I think that's quite persuasive and that that is um, the way we, we communicate. That's what the World Wide Web started to make um, possible from about 1993, I suppose. Um, so a lot of this writing started to emerge in the mid to late 90s and some of it was um, uh, associated with the electronic arts movement, like um, Isaiah, I heard Pierre Levy speak, um, and it was in the early stages of, um, of hypertext and the whole idea of writing including all these other things, whereas so it was um, taking the term multimedia to its logical extension and make it, making it um, something very fluid, liquid media was another one. So you do see some Oh, definitely, things. yes, definitely. Um, and of course, um, uh, I, I was more doing a defence of the old-fashioned book than um, talk, and uh, largely because I've been taken by the ferocity of the, sure. the futurists and this doctrine sure. of progress, which I find rather um, unthinking, and it doesn't seem very self-reflective -reflect sure. and don't seem to be aware that they're mouthing this um, doctrine of progress that was part of industrial modernity and has just been switched into the post-industrial age. But on the other hand, I do see the merits, as you say, of all the... Um, as Liz was saying, the distribution of text and the reading of text. I, I read a Kindle at night, 
So, uh, you know, um, I like the fact that you don't have to turn the light on to read it, and you can download all these various um, texts. And as you say, that uh, the multimodality of writing has become very important, uh, and the use of image in that. So, perhaps in a, in a future, uh, future of writing symposium, we'll address that. Probably get you to speak on it, Catherine. Okay. Did you want to add anything to Catherine's question? Um. Yeah, well, no, I haven't got much to add. There's a, I, I think it's interesting that people are kind of stuck. You know, the, the, near, the near futurology is always kind of on the rather clunky technology. Now, I, I like Kevin Kelly on this, who's the one oracular, short sentence, breathless, urgent kind of guy who I find convincing uh, in that was it what technology wants, mm -hmm. the book he did last year, yes. where he kind of looks at patterns of technological change specific to a whole lot of technologies and the actual curves and the arcs and what happens, and doesn't just go five years. He goes, well, you know, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. And he's got a quite lyrical piece that he wrote a few years ago on screens. And he actually kind of thinks there, it is quite persuasive when, when it will be as easy somehow to employ an image as it will be to write a letter so that we'll be using something like alphabet and something like images as effortlessly as we do as we type a sentence now. It's kind of inconceivable but he's sort of in this almost poetic short sentence mode. Um, you know, I can't remember what that piece is called. That's not in what technology wants. It's a thing he wrote a few years ago. Then again, he is a totally... Um, He's a Christian. He's he's uh, what do you call eminence? What's the the other worldview? Um, transcendence. Tra yeah, transcendence. Uh, just because it's late, it's been a long day, where where everything you know is heading to a to a history's heading to a point of grand Wagnerian finality. Uh, so that's the way he sees it. But it's very persuasive. So he does think that that image sound words, letters, will kind of merge in centuries to come. I mean, at the moment, I would say, just in the simple kind of reality of day-to-day -day life, it's still very clunky, isn't it? Even if you want to do something with the device uh, in your pocket uh, that's filmic or photographic or I imagistic, it's kind of still easier just to send an email, send a text, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it is for me, anyway. I say that, and I'm an image guy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and it was covered from two different perspectives at the Future of Writing last November, which went over two days, and I invited people to speak on that, and the first was in the context of journalism, and it was about amateur journalism, if you like, that, um, as I showed, people like The Guardian and other newspapers invite kind of bloggers to be part of the ensemble of news gathering, um, and Twitter has become so important that people are on the, you know, just firing off news information. And one of the presentations was talking about the rise of the amateur journalist and how journalism can deal with that because they're incorporating work by people who aren't professional trained journalists, but they're taking that in as part of their, you know, their data sphere, if you like, of what the media text is. And there was an argument for a kind of code of ethics that would incorporate kind of amateur writing because it was such a transformation um, of that whole role of what journalism was, that you, you know, you have to train to be a journalist um, and you're bound by certain ethical uh, professional codes. The other way it came up was, um, 
in relation to publishing. Let me think, what was I going to say? There were, on the second day, someone else. What else did you ask about, Amazon? Yeah, I know what you were going to say. Yeah. You're going to talk about the guy who writes the adventure novels. Oh, yeah, self-publishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there was, that's right. I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you're here. Uh, yes. Um, I'll be your second banana any time. That's right. Uh, uh, there was also um, someone talking in defence of self-publishing because that was, again, breaking down the barriers in that um, anyone that can now self-publish. You can actually put whatever you want as a blog on the internet and you can do it as um, uh, uh, a whole novel. And if you want to get it printed out, you just go to one of those printing companies like lulu.com and you can print off as many copies as you want. And this was, again, a challenge to the whole idea of the professional writer and the gatekeepers of the publishers and the associated ones like agents, etc. Um, and it was pointed out that there's still a, a kind of derision or scorn um, directed at the self-publisher as, um, you know, a hack writer who couldn't actually get through the gatekeeper so they self-published. But of course there are notable exceptions to that like Proust and others who had to self-publish because they couldn't get um, publishers. However, um, there did appear to be a major challenge to the whole idea of the professional writer and the professional organisation of um, self-publishing. And then uh, a more recent development has been the self-published work, which has a large number of hits, or if it's bought on online, or sales if it's published in paper form, which is then taken up by publishers. So again, it's the bleed of the amateur, you know, non-professional writer who self-publishes and then is taken across. So that has become, in fact, a kind of new live stream for publishing, especially in the UK. Uh, one of the articles that's going to go in the Future of Writing book this year is on self-publishing and how it has challenged those whole notions of the professional writer and the publisher, the editor, etc. And in fact, has then been uh, absorbed by the publishing industry to some extent. The big example, of course, is um, Fifty Shades of Grey, whatever it was called and all the many imitators of that. Yeah, so that's a very interesting topic and one that certainly people in the publishing industry and the journalism industry were very aware of and made uncomfortable by, but realising that it's something that again is a response to the possibilities of this, these new technologies that they have to deal with. It seemed to be in the publishing that uh, there was still, for now, the sense that it was still something to be desired to be taken into a publishing house. So the person who self-publishes and has some success is then very happy to sign a contract and go over. So in that sense, where it's leading at the moment is that it's another avenue or another step to get published. You do it yourself first and then someone takes you up. And there were quite a number of examples of that. Peter might know about that. Peter's a published writer. Yep. Amazon yep. recently, last The, the 360 contract being the one where the the man, as we call him, um, has has a little bit of everything that the artist does, the record, the performances, yeah. any uh, any any merch yeah. activity at all. Do you know of anything in publishing? I, I can't think of anything even remotely like that. In, in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's <laughs> a sort of publishing houses off the top of my head seem to be. Even the kind of boldness that a that a commissioning editor was expected to demonstrate in the '90s or even in the early noughts is completely gone. And commissioning editors, uh, you know, one hears anecdotally are entirely beholden 
to the to the um, you know the accountants, basically the, the business, the marketing people, and so they're uh, they're not thinking big in any way at all, and they're not and and rather than wanting to kind of because that seems to me that's sort of like <coughs> you come with us, you join our our thing, and we'll look after you. We'll take a bit of everything, but there will be an everything to take a bit of. Whereas in publishing, it's like maybe if we just get this out, we can get a few shekels back on this here. And it seems to be the entirely opposite mindset, one of, of great caution, minor expectations, you know, minimal expectations, except in the cases of the sort of viral books, I suppose. And I've got, and there they'd have even less leverage, wouldn't they, in the sort of Fifty Shades, J.K. Rowling thing. But I've not heard of anything like that. But then again, what do I know? I'm, I'm so fringe in the publishing uh, world and I... I just deal now with publishers who are friends, who I like, and I don't even deal with any kind of publishers in big buildings. <laughs> any final questions for John or Peter? Yep. Well, look, the journalism uh, people were quite worried. You know, they are, everyone I know in journalism is uh, very worried. Uh, and the big attempt by um, Fairfax is happening on July 2nd when they introduce um, metered subscription. And it's um, generally thought they've made a mistake in allowing smh.com to be free. So, you know, 77% of their readers have been doing it for free for, for years. And now they're going to try to make it pay. And we know from even... In, uh, attempts by Murdoch to have paywalls, they don't always work. Uh, so I think they're, they're quite, quite concerned, and all the journalists I know um, have gone through terrible retrenchments, and there's a great deal of anxiety, even in, um, in the very few publications that are, are still making a profit, because it does appear to be such an unstable world, and they find it very hard to actually make the revenue. Um, it's fine to have all the, you know, tens of thousands of hits, but the revenue on um, the online newspaper is still very meagre compared for advertising compared to the old print, what used to be called the rivers of gold. So they're really struggling to actually um, make, it, make it work at all. So the, the interesting thing will be to see what happens in July if people um, take up the metered subscription. No, no, and it's just a... Uh, well, of course, um, that's the big fear because they've had to cut back. Uh, they've cut back a lot of the, the foreign correspondence, for example. Uh, the Guardian still seems to be uh, functioning and expanding. They seem to find ways for it to work. Yes, that's true. Fairfax is uh, really struggling and warding off um, Gina Reinhardt every other week. <laughs> who wants to turn it into a propaganda organ, so uh, we'll defend their right against that. Um, no, but they do look um, rather pessimistic, and I was surprised listening to um, the director of um, Fairfax Media. He was actually quite open on a number of things. One was he admitted that the online newspaper um, could tend to be a bit more sensationalist because they do have this massive temptation and they can see the hits, and the hits are... A, tending in one way and they find it very hard to resist that. And secondly, he said um, they probably keep the print newspaper going for a while because the ads pay so much better. And the newspapers, the printed ones, are actually paying for the online and all the stuff. You know, and a few years ago they had um, a division between the newspaper stuff and the online and now it's all one and things go to online first because that's instantaneous. So they're struggling, but look, they're very dedicated people. You know, they want to keep it going, but um, they're, they're full of anxiety. However, uh, hopefully, I mean, I want to support them to have that kind of quality news continue. Otherwise, we just get um, Rupert Murdoch, who can afford to run things at a loss and run propaganda sheets, which is what he does with the Australian. Okay. Right, well, if I can ask you to thank John for his wonderful paper. I think what was impressive about John's paper was really the power of cultural history to contextualise for us 
these sort of sloganistic, you know, apocalyptic visions of technologies. And I think, you know, marshalling that cultural history, contextualised it, so it made it intelligible for us and looked at the sort of sedimented pace, even when it seems revolutionary. As mm. you said, I think, Peter, there's that aggregation of technologies which we lose sight of when we hear all the sloganeering. And um, I thought that was really illuminating and, and important to, to hear. So thank you, John, for your paper. And thank you for your considered response too, Peter. If we can thank you. <laughs>